Okay. So, welcome, guys. Thank you for tuning in to our fifth episode, right, Joy? Yes, yes fifth is. episode. Um, my name is Bea, and my name is Joy. And today we are joined by three really amazing people and good friends Vance, Sophia, and Calvin. So, it's going to be a super special episode. Um, to get started, like we usually do, we are going to let each person introduce themselves, just say, like, name, age, and then the topic of this episode is theory and improvisation. So maybe a little bit of your experience with that. But first, Bay and I are going to introduce ourselves because we realized that in the entirety of the series, we have yet to introduce ourselves. <laughs> it is the fifth episode and we Good have job. not introduced ourselves. You guys might not know who we are. <laughs> yeah. Listen to us. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Bea. Um, I'm 16 still. And I've had, like, I've taken a, a theory course at the community college by my house. Um, but that's pretty much it with theory. It's, a, it's I just need to work on that. Um, and I play drums sets, and percussion and some other stuff. But, you know. How about you, Joy? Uh, yeah, my name is Joy. I'm 17 and I play bass and I've taken AP Music Theory and IB Music at my school. So I have a little experience with those things. But like the cool part of this episode is I think we're all in different places as far as where our theory knowledge is and what instrument we play. So uh, yeah, Vance, you next. So I'm Vance. I'm a 18 year old guitarist and experience with theory. I, I, did a, I just graduated from a Berkeley City Music program, so they offer theory classes. So I've had Berkeley taught theory for basically five years of my life. And I, the most recently was the highest level. So I went over like harmonic analysis and tritone subs and secondary dominance and all that fun stuff. So I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Sophia Griswold. I'm 18. I play the trombone and sing mostly. Um, and theory knowledge. I take an AP theory too, which was the time. <laughs> and uh, I've done like some like summer programs and stuff with uh, Berkeley and um, Jazz at Lincoln Center. And they do like some theory stuff there. So. I'm Kalman Strauss. Uh, I'm an 18-year-old violinist, uh, multi-instrumentalist, composer, and producer. Um, and with theory, I'm mostly self-taught. Um, but I also have studied uh, at Berkeley and other summer programs, um, and also with uh, one of my uh, jazz teachers a while back. Um, he kind of provided me with a, a basis, a foundation for me to, to study by myself. So just to get the conversation started, because this is going to be less like interview style and more of just a casual conversation with five friends, the ragtag nice. group. About um, coffee. Yeah. So. That's the way to, it's coffee talk. That's the way to do it. Yeah, I should have got some coffee. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to learning theory, I'm sure everyone has their own like thought as far as how important it is, because you know that you hear all those musicians out there who have not studied any theory at all, but have amazing feel. So maybe we could all talk about like the contrast between feel and theory and where like the give and take yeah. is for those. Um, I can talk, I guess, first. Um, so, all right, my, my, how I kind of go about it is like, um, I think the problem a lot of the time is people go like theory first and then ear, if that makes sense. Like, like in school, they'll start teaching you improv from like a place of like, um, you know, like theory and like this is what sounds good. And then people get to like, they overthink it too much. But I think um, a good way to go about it is like ear first and just start with like trying what sounds good. What I try to do is like when I'm approaching the theory and stuff, I like play it for myself and then I like sing it and try to get it in my ear. So that I'm taking the theory and I'm getting it in my ear and like getting it in my subconscious so that like when I um, start playing, like I won't have to think about it because it's in my ear. I'm in agreement though with the ears though. Like ears are, ears are first to me. I mean, theory is super important to knowing what you're doing. But at the end of the day, 
what would you rather who would you rather play with someone who studies music or someone who you know plays music and knows what it's supposed to sound like and what they want to play and stuff like that i mean when you're when i guess when i'm approaching it i mean i use theory to organize my thoughts i guess you could say especially with guitar your best friend or modes like to intertwine modes but then you kind of incorporate other ideas into it to make it you know what sounds good and uh i'm having a brain fart god damn <laughs> <laughs> you see, right. that's what theory does to us All right, i was just gonna say that like it's kind of a mixture of both because you're using your ears to kind of intertwine everything together to just make it sound good when it comes to improvisation. Um, I was actually like fortunate or unfortunate, but I, I started with the theory part. I, I was classically trained as a violinist. Um, so I had to kind of step out of that mindset to be able to kind of get that foundation of feel. I was really lucky to be able to, to, to get my kind of foundation in jazz in feel. And so like for me, what the, what the best way to incorporate them both um, is I kind of use theory as a way to make people feel more. I feel like theory can actually be a tool to create ideas that, you know, can talk to people's emotions more than just playing whatever sounds good. Um, but again, if you let it take over too much, then it really just becomes like just playing, playing what you know, playing what, you know, all the scales and the modes that you're taught in theory class and then, you know, the, the emotion is taken out of it. Yeah. I feel like one thing that I've heard a lot when it comes to stuff like that is that you know that you're using theory well when there's like a musician in the audience and they're not thinking about the theory you're using. They're too busy feeling the music. That's how you know that it's like, mm -hmm. that it's good. That's what's yeah. important at the end of the day. You, you have to be a certain type of person to be able to, both think through everything and like process it while also feeling it. And I think that's definitely where I struggle when it comes to jam sessions and stuff like that. Cause there half the time I'll be like, Oh, I know this super cool riff. And then I'll be like, Oh wait, I need to calm down. I need to play something from the heart. And then. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard so many people talk about it. Like you, you think when you practice and <laughs> you think when you practice, but then you turn your brain off when you're playing and just try to use those ideas that you've been practicing and shedding and you know and it's all intertwined it's in some way with the theory and the feel it's, it's kind of like yeah well that's also kind of the point you, you practice so you're able to let go you practice the ideas and all, all the theory and the motifs and, and all the lines that you play so that you can let go of that you just made that huge switch in the opposite direction because usually people start off with like feeling it first or learning by ear or doing mm -hmm. something like that, then make the switch over to like reading music and knowing the theory. So yeah. how do you, what are some of the like obstacles that you ran into when dealing with that? So that is a really good question. Um, the main obstacle was just kind of trying to get out of this rigid mindset. So the, like classical, like, you know, the top classical musicians are very creative and do not ha have a rigid mindset at all. But when I'm like nine years old and I'm, you know, training classical violin, they, you know, they train you to have this really rigid mindset to be an, you know, an orchestra violinist. And so I was not at all able to like open up to, oh, what if I decide to play this different note, this different note? So I really had to kind of just let go and, and feel the music and, and let go of all that stuff. I, I listened to a lot of music, listened to a lot of solos, um, and tried to kind of replicate that stuff. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It's, it, 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 it was a long time ago enough that it, I was able to make that change uh, fairly easily. Um, but I also had to completely, in terms of theory, I had to completely overturn my knowledge of theory. Because um, really, the main thing that uh, translated from classical to jazz was my ability to read music. And that's kind of it. Um, you know, I had a bit, of a bit of an ear, but besides that, all the chord theory and, and, um, and the modes and all that stuff, I'm not taught in classical. Um, so it was a, it was a challenging switch, switch to make, but I'm definitely glad I did it. You know, I love, I love jazz and I love all that stuff. One thing I really like about classical music. So when I listen to it, I love dynamics and how the entire mm. group can interpret Ooh. a dynamic together. 
So I feel like yeah. when it comes to playing and jamming or being as a band, that's something that all musicians could really take away from classical music. So, so true. I feel like dynamics are not nearly used enough in, in jazz and in, in other, you know, similar styles. You know, there, there are definitely things that each, each uh, genre can take from the other and, and dynamics would make any, any jazz group so much, it would lift them, really. Definitely. Plus, it's like, classical music's one of the main genres that you can definitely see a whole group working together. Because it's like, you have the whole ensemble together, and then inside of that, you have each section that's supposed to be playing the exact same thing, having the same bowings, the same attack, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So... I just think it's really interesting to watch a classical performance and sit there as like, cause I'm mainly a rock musician. So to sit there as a rock musician and see how powerful it can be to use those skills that I typically don't see. It's just, it's, it's kind of like, it takes you to a different place. Yeah. And you can also see like once, once you're a musician of your level, like you can see how many similarities there actually are between classical and rock and jazz and whatever other like music and how they are all built on the same foundation of dynamics you know of of ensemble work and and of theory like they're all bit built on the same you know chord basic th chord theory if you get to a high enough level of theory you can realize that they're all just you know four two five ones in classical that's that's all it is you know yeah mm -hmm. do you feel like um playing so much classical music yeah. like your playing and like your writing um is like influenced by that like does it come in does it show through like your writing at all or like you're playing like you know at, classical background at first it was and then I kind of like I, I got pretty alienated with classical music and just wanted to completely you know kind of put it, it out of my head um but <laughs> lately I've, I've tried to incorporate it back uh, more into some of my fusion stuff because it, it really has a lot of potential to um to be incorporated into that music so, you know, I think it just depends on, on which direction you want to go. Yeah. Um, maybe we should also say, maybe you guys should also say what genres of music you guys play. All right. I, I'm, I play R and pop R&B and neo-soul mainly. So basically, I'm an Instagram guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> no shade. But that's, usually, that's mainly what I play. Yeah, it's like rock and pop are like the main things that I do. It's actually really funny because I didn't know that. And this whole time we've known each other, I sort of just found out she plays rock. I thought she was like a jazz or a yeah. funk bassist. She, she like sends me a ton Wait, of jazz. Is that true? Standards. She, yeah, I mainly play rock. But when we met each other, we were like doing neo soul jams and stuff like that. <laughs> right. So I think she just assumed that I played that type of music. And she so always. Are you there for the rock word? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yes. <laughs> so that's that. on Bea. <laughs> Bea. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what type of music do you play? All right. Um, I play. Um, I like jazz, neo soul. Um, like what else? Freaking um, like funk fusion, those kind of things, you know. So. Calvin? Yeah, um, may, honestly, I don't even know how to narrow it down. It's a problem <laughs> working on myself. But uh, you know, I had a crisis. Fusion and jazz and funk and classical and you know, soul and whatever. Yeah. I think just all of us having met at Berkeley, we've talked a lot about Berkeley today, but all of us having met at Berkeley, that's why I think Berkeley is one of those places that you just get so many different genres, like not really pushed oh. on you, but you just have the chance to look at so many different genres. So that's yeah, why we can yeah. all say that we listen to so many different things or play so many different things. And it makes you appreciate Except those. For me. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you play like every instrument yeah. in the world. You do, girl. Don't even. Yeah. But it Fake makes you until you make it. Like it makes you appreciate other stuff. Well, yeah. No, yeah. You, you can definitely learn a lot like listening to different genres. Because like, you know, like I'll like once in a great while, like pop over to like I don't know some genre that's not jazz related <laughs> and then i'm like oh like you know i've never heard that approach and i can like take something that i've i've heard from that and like try to apply it to my own music like every genre has like its strengths you know yeah mm -hmm. um so to pick up where we were leaving off with everyone naming their genres bea you want to say what you play and do um 
yeah, pretty much everything you guys said, you know, um, but no one mentioned hip hop. So I had that in there and um, also a bunch of Latin music, Afro-Cuban, the roots, man, and West yeah. African music, especially yeah. with the yeah. definitely get into that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the funk, neo soul, gospel, jazz, yes. all that good stuff. We grooving. Talking about feel. That's that's feel right there. Yeah, you know, right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were all, or a minute ago, we were just talking about like bridging the gaps between between genres. So I feel like on a theory level, when you listen to stuff like pop music and it's like four chords or something like that, you think, oh, this theory's so simple. But then you listen to jazz music and you're like, well. How do you go from, how do you realistically go from being like a four chords musician to like a jazz musician? What would you guys say? Is uh-huh. like- well, <laughs> practice, first of all. But uh, I mean, I like to think of, I, th- I like to think of R&B as kind of like the middle ground between that because it's like, it's easy to listen to. But if you listen closely, because that's what we did in my theory class this year for City Music, like they got some, they put some stuff in there, like some special sauce with the tension. <laughs> So I think that's one thing is just to play music like that and also practice different complexities of music to get yourself a bit more, yeah, get yourself a bit more like educated and more versatile when it comes to that stuff. Because when you're playing the four chord pop tunes and you're coming from some, from playing jazz like the next week, the more ideas and more things you can put on it that might fit into the context. How would you say you'd go about making this switch from learning from either starting from like whatever or chord stuff going into jazz music theory listening it's like again another thing i heard it was it's just like it's like trying to speak a language without hearing it mm. so, that's really good yeah yeah uh, i would also say i don't i i think that a lot of pop is actually much more complicated and complex than people listening think it is and you know not all pop obviously um but if you actually listen to all the different parts in in a good pop tune um most of the good pop tunes can actually be break broken down in a very similar chordal way as jazz can be broken down um so if you kind of can get inside that the chords of a pop tune and really hear what the the musical movement is going on that's going to really help you with your movement in jazz and and with the chords in jazz Mm -hmm. One thing I really like to do when it comes to um, practicing over different songs or different genres is like, I'll start out just with whatever basic scale I'm playing. So like major or minor, and then I'll like start adding in different things, like maybe do Dorian or Mixolydian from there. And then like actually go into jamming instead of just going up and down the scales and seeing how that helps. I like to, I like to, cause I know bass and guitar are kind of a similar instrument in that respect. Um, I do a lot of like maybe some chromatic approaches when it comes to that. That's for my time studying a bit of jazz to teach myself how to become more well-rounded musician it's a good way to do that is study jazz but um yeah chromatic approaches and just arpeggios too that works really well for me and um even sometimes even like putting chords into your solo improvisation that's that's always a cool way to do it wait what do you like outlining chords yeah you can outline chords or you can actually play like yeah, you can play the outlines of the chords. Like you can play like the three and the seven of it, the f- three and a flat seven of a of a dominant chord when that dominant chord hits. Advantage of being a guitarist, there. You can do it on violin, <laughs> and bass, <laughs> <laughs> on horns and stuff like that. I don't really know. Uh, you can just play the <laughs> arpeggios. Yeah, like how do I do that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking as a harmonic instrument. So I'm. I really wish I played a har- um, a horn so I could think more melodically, but. Ooh. I can sing while playing the trombone. I figured out how to like hum Whoa. while blowing the air. Wait, like not actually, to flex, not to flex on everyone, but like, like, like hire me. I can play two notes at once on my trombone. I would hire that. I would want that at my birthday party. Really? For real, I'd hire that for a wedding gig. My birthday party. <laughs> They're fun. Birthday parties are just fun. <laughs> I guess weddings. Those are whatever. Everyone, everyone gets married. Yeah, but they pay well. But not everyone gets a birthday. <laughs> not, not everyone, everyone gets a birthday. <laughs> not everyone gets one special Just day. Just lucky people. Just the lucky people get born, you know. <laughs> I'm learning so much. Yeah. Such as not everyone gets a birthday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
See, this is this is what they te- this is what they teach you at Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, what were we even talking about before we got off on? I think um, like jazz and oh, pop. And- chordal instruments versus oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like something you could do as a horn player is instead of like actually playing a chord since you can't maybe just visualizing the chords in your head and that'll give you like a better idea of where you want to go i'm not really sure yeah playing with the changes i think Mm -hmm. i'm i think i'm like the extreme of like not thinking about theory while i play like i do not think yeah it's kind of (laughs) bad no it's not because you're operating on feel and how you're feeling in the music and yeah and then you're a high enough level musician that you can play with the theory in your head without actually talking about it you know yeah I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you could, you could probably take a couple of weeks, and then you'd be like thinking about like, oh, I gotta hit the, I gotta hit like the double flat seven of this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. I don't even know. <laughs> no, but um, but uh, what was I gonna say? Um, oh yeah. So I think I just like use theory when practicing. So it's like if there's notes that would sound good to hit, like in my practice, like hitting them and then like getting them in my ear. Like, you know what I mean? So just using theory, like, when practicing. And then, like, thinking in that, like, the, uh, like theory mindset while soloing when I'm practicing. So that, like, using that theory and using those, like, cool, like, theory tricks and stuff. Um, just doing that, like, when practicing and then hoping that it'll just kind of stick, come to me in the it's- moment. Like using muscle memory, if I use this scale enough times during practice, hopefully during yeah, the show. Yeah, then I'll just hear it, you know, when it's yeah. right. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So how would you bridge the two? Like go from playing a chord to like maybe an arpeggio and then to like going into a line? Um, okay, so I usually, so usually like the pe- I look at the changes and I try to like generalize what key I'm in, I mean. Hopefully you know what key you're in when you're soloing um, or doing something like that. Joy. <laughs> Hopefully. So you're, you're trying to bridge the gap from lines to arpeggios to um, just going back into the main groove. How to just make the whole thing like... Cohesive? Yeah. I mean, so I give like... I usually give myself like some target notes to like kind of like base the thing around. Because, you know, with our style of instrument you can really just box yourself into one area and it sounds fine but like you don't i don't feel satisfied doing that so but i mean it's perfectly fine to do that um but yeah i usually just with the arpeggios you know you ha- you use your arpeggios as those target notes for the chord and then you just fill in the box with you know a six or a four or if you want to or if that chord has specific tensions that you want to play for it like when i was Usually if you're playing like over a major chord, you can do four, you can do sharp four over it, you can do a nine over it or something like that. And then you can use those target notes to kind of like, I don't know, make it more interesting with your arpeggios and stuff like that. If you know what tensions can work over a uh, a chord, then you can use those notes along with your arpeggio and the scale to kind of like, you know, make it, there, there's a fly, sorry. Um, <laughs> to go over the chord yeah yeah some universal theory topics some things we haven't talked about drummers at all or given them anything to think about either <clears throat> well there's only one in here <clears throat> they don't need anything to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe just like talking about theory involving or like soloing <laughs> and rhythms adding space and stuff into your improvisation instead of s- s- like spewing out all the information you know giving it space to breathe and picking yeah. rhythms wisely. How do you guys go about that? That's a good question. Because most of the time, I want to fire out really fast licks and make it look impressive. Yeah, oh. but it's it's just oh, you about. Know what? Oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I was gonna say I can talk on that because I play the trombone, and it's hard to play fast. <laughs> it hurts the arm. You know, I good get tired. Out. So. I kind of rely sometimes on like rhythms and trying to be creative with stuff. Um, and like, you know, going more melodically and less like, like rapid fire. Um, rhythm sometimes is like one of the most important parts of the solo in my opinion, because I think what makes a good solo, at least in jazz, like I, I like to approach soloing as like 
I want to involve as many other, as many of the musicians up here as possible, you know? Um, like that's the goal is to like try to get everyone involved in what I'm doing. Like that's the approach. So it's basically trying to give people stuff to work with. So then um, like rhythm, like using rhythm is a good way to do that. Cause um, if you, if you like hang on like one like rhythmic motif or something and like um, kind of just like milk that and like, I don't know, stare down the drummer or something like they'll get the point. And then that's when like, if you listen to jazz and stuff and you're listening to solos, like there's always like a pinnacle, like there's like some point where it gets to like this like height and it's like so exciting and you're like, what is happening? Like the whole entire band has just like lifted into this like yes. crazy, like amazing mm -hmm. experience. Um, and I think, um, yeah, that's what that's what you want to get to. The point of soloing is not to like show like how good you are at playing your instrument and how much you practiced. It's the, in my opinion, the reason I listen to jazz and the reason I like it is because when a solo um, gets to that point and everyone is just like in sync and like feeding off each other and gets to that height, it just mm -hmm. You just like, I don't know, I don't know. It's just like this like connection that you feel and like you feel like everyone listening is like with you, like in that place. So, yeah. yeah. For me, I don't know. It's always tempting for me mm -hmm. to like when I'm listening to someone else solo right before me to plan out, ooh, I want to do that in my solo. I want to do that yeah. in my solo. And then like as soon as I get solo, just like throw it all in, even if it doesn't fit. Um, so what I have to do is I have to let go of that and I have to play with space and I have to kind of build up a solo and build up a story from, from the very foundation. And, you know, it's, it's taken me a while to kind of learn to play with space. Um, but what I actually try to think about is um, I try to imagine myself as a horn player, which means that every so often I have to take a breath for air. Because I can't just, you know, assuming I don't know how to, you know, whatever, you know, breathe, and, you know, hold my breath for 10 minutes or do the circular breathing. You know, you have to take a, a breath for air and you have to take a, a breather in, in, in your story, whatever the story you're telling is. And then if you can uh, do that, then it allows you to do what Sophia was talking about and build up to this huge height that everyone is with you and the whole band is just supporting you. But if you start from there, then there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to build up to. Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. No, I was going to say that there's there's always like a stigma when it comes to soloing that you're like, it's your time to sh is to come and said it's your time to shine. You got to put everything you know out onto the stage so everyone's impressed with you. I mean, I think I think I'm guilty of that. I don't know if you guys are guilty of that or not, because you know you're kind of like super killing musicians, so you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've I've been really t teaching myself to hold back and tell a story, like you said, because it's more emotional that way, and it leaves a better response on your audience. I think of like you know more, you're feeling it more than just showing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. most of the time i'm just like all right time to rip out this cool pentatonic rock solo for this rock song because that's what fits the style but you're not really thinking about it you're just thinking oh what would like what would jimmy page do <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah and like another thing i i try to think about is like um like i when i'm soloing i try to put my attention like as if i was not myself like I <laughs> like I I try to like get myself in tune with like other people and like kind of read the room you know what I mean so if you can feel that like you're not holding people's attention or whatever like you're not engaging everyone then that's when you realize okay I have to like try something new you know um and then try to keep um doing different things to like engage people and get people's attention like um, if people are start, if you feel like the vibe is starting to like just like get flat and like people aren't really it's just kind of like everyone's that's when you like pull something like people weren't expecting you know like for mm -hmm. example um, if you just do like a super drastic like dynamic change or something and you um, get really soft and then that gets people's attention because they're like what's happening everybody's you know 
and just trying to like trying to have that awareness um like as if like as if you're having a conversation or something or like you're like um you know I'm losing people yeah. I need to like you know make things interesting um so just like reading the room and like letting mm -hmm. people's vibe and like the feel of that to kind of tell you what direction to go mm -hmm. I think one of my hands down favorite things about Bea's playing is that she's so good at reading the room and she's really good at picking up on like any vibe you put down. It's so like how Sophia was saying, you play a rhythm and you repeat it and you make eye contact. Bea is like, as far as musicians I've played with, she's one of the best people at doing that. So Bea, teach me how to do yes, that. Bea. Teach me how to read Ooh. the room. What's, what's your advice on that? I think, well, okay. Then the the one thing I do the most is listen. When you play, making not making the music about yourself. Because you're sharing the band sound with other people. You're not trying to just be like, everyone look at me, like I'm the greatest. You're also playing with other great people. So I think for me as a drummer, setting that like foundation and stage to uplift people, I like to bounce off of their rhythms. So if they play something, I'll like do something and it'll be like playing tag like oh do I'd be like oh do do like at the same time. So that's always a lot of fun and it adds like your personality to the music as well. Um but in regards with like soloing, like I can totally fill up space with a bunch of notes. But um I think for me I, I like to play a lot with the space also. Um, and, or like if you're trading fours, um, and like the horn player is like playing something, I'll try to remember what they do and sort of add that into my rhythms or, or what notes they're playing since drums are tuned. <laughs> I can play <laughs> like different, um, tones as well, but I think really just playing off of people and not trying to show over them but yeah and, and incorporate it together mm -hmm. so like maybe um, sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say that like that's something about um rhythm section players it's like they they go about things from like a comping standpoint and they're like super good at listening and trying to like hype people up you know and, and taking what they're doing and like you know um rolling with it and like jumping on things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that like being in that position teaches you a lot. Um, and I feel like, uh, like I get distracted with rhythm section instruments sometimes. And I feel like, like that's kind of taught me to go about things from that mindset. So I feel like, especially for horn players, like, or like one note at a time players, <laughs> like it's good to like have a little bit of <laughs> a background in like, um, comping or stuff like that so you know what that's like and then I think like approaching a solo as if you're comping mm -hmm. is like a way to get people engaged what were you gonna I say think, um, like, go ahead um something that helps me a lot either mainly with soloing but also with playing is really listening and learning a lot of the roots of music like African drumming and um, Afro-Cuban rhythms. So I feel like learning those um, those rhythms really just help you voice. Studying different genres and getting in those fields and locking those in and incorporating it into what you're trying to say when you're soloing or what you're playing with other people. Um, I think that really helps you develop your sound as a musician um, in general because you can take from different genres and put in your own feel and also mix them up. And then fusion, boom. But that's pretty much what my playing does. Yeah, go ahead, Joy. That's cool. Um, I was just gonna ask about when when do you know like enough is enough as far as building up? Because there's a, there's a such thing as like building up the solo and getting to the high point, And then there's a such thing as like piling on noise. How do you become the musician that's not just piling it on? Um, I've always kind of wanted to end my solo too early. Um, 
but then when I like, which is like some, I, I, I know different people struggle with different things. That was always my thing. I always ended it before I went to the, the height that I, you know, I had the possibility of going to because I like, I felt like, oh, I can't really play faster than this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm done with that. And then like, I, I've tried to work against that because, you know, really once you're in the middle of a solo, you can push yourself. Not only can you push what you're playing, you can push yourself to other heights. Um, and so like once I really feel like the band has gotten to a peak, I try to like a solo for me isn't really complete until I wind it back down. And so that then no matter how long it is, um, as long as it's a complete story and as, as long as it's, it has an ending that's not just like ending right at the top, then it feels like a satisfying and a good amount or, or good length. For me. Mm-hmm. And when, when you're soloing, it, I mean, you're kind of in charge of the band now. You're kind of the front man. So you can control dynamics. You can, for for your, the beginning of the solo, you can have them, you can look at, you can look at them and say, hey, bring it down with your eyes. Like, it's all about communication on stage. How do you have the, like, confidence to command the band like that? Because you're already feeling a little nervous since you're soloing and just putting it right. all out there. Where do you get the confidence from? I think it's just doing it so much. Honestly, like, if you the, the more the more you do it the more numb you get to it and the more you're like all right this is what's going to happen for my solo because it's my solo because i mean there's that selfish moment but you also want to play with the yeah you also want to play with the band though so like of course you don't want to be ripping out like crazy notes while they're when they're, they're like shh, 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 and you're ripping out this crazy thing like a charlie parker thing that you want to kind of make that go out into like when the when the drummer is like crashing away at a cymbal and the bass player is just doing this really dope ass lick at the bot like the top of the neck or something like that but yeah communication also a thing that helps me with like nerves and stuff is i feel like if i'm nervous that means my head is not in the right place mm-hmm. like if i'm yeah. nervous it means that i i think i'm playing mm-hmm. here today to show people that i am good at music like that's where nerves come from but when I when I go about it from like, okay, I'm playing music because like it's for the music. If you think about the music and you're just listening and like vibing for the sake of the music and you're not trying to impress anyone, you know, I think obviously it's easier said than done. Like you're going to like, that's human. Like you're going to be like, I want to sound good. I want to impress people. But like just to like help refocus yourself and be like, why am I like deep down? Why am I playing this music? Like, you know. At the end of the day, you're the, yeah. At the end of the day, you gotta tell yourself, "I'm here to have fun. I'm not here to impress anyone or do anything that that comes secondary. You're here for your own personal enjoyment and for doing something that you love. So it is kind of in the wrong. You want to get out of that mindset that I need to do this. I need to do that. And, and you have to get out of the mindset of of like how other people feel about your music. Like you know, you're putting out yourself, and you're hoping that that's going to make an impact on other people. But you can't worry about oh, like if I'm going to be good enough in their eyes. You're you're trying to worry about like moving them and playing what you want to play. And so like really, I think that's where what you were saying comes in, Sophia. You know. Yeah, and also I'm just thinking of something now too. Um, like I believe that like whatever because okay, music is like the well the arts are like the language of emotion. Like music is the language of emotion. Like that's what you're doing. You're using it to talk and your talking is showing what you're feeling. So if I think that whatever you are feeling, the audience will feel too. And that's just like a direct thing. And you're using the music to basically tell them what you're feeling and put it in them like a mirror to mirror what you are feeling. But anyways, um, if you are like, if you're like nervous and thinking about like, Oh, I, I sound good and that kind of thing that's what the audience will feel you know Mm -hmm. um like i've been to jazz shows where they're like like they just look stressed like they're not having fun they're just hoping that they sound good and trying to mess up and i felt stressed you know i felt stressed watching it and i'm like i felt like i was about to mess up but like i wasn't even on stage i was watching (laughs) like you know um (laughs) but like if you just know that it doesn't at the end of the day it does not matter what you play or how good you're playing or the um this is kind of i don't know but it doesn't matter if you mess up how much you mess up at all in my opinion Mm -hmm. it just matters 
I, like unless you're like unless it's like an extreme level <laughs> but yeah. like, okay but um <laughs> like you know um it doesn't matter like the actual messing up doesn't matter because it's all about what you're feeling so if mm-hmm. you're not like upset by the mess ups that you're making um and you're just having fun they're going to be having fun you know yeah. and if you're still into it and still passionate about what you're playing they're going to be into it and passionate like so if you play a couple like wrong notes like however you feel about that is what they're going to feel so notes themselves yeah. messing those up doesn't matter it's just how you like respond to it i feel like i think i do that a lot too sometimes um when i play just getting in your head and thinking oh my gosh they might not like that mm-hmm. i feel like it's good that we touched upon that yeah, I'm sort, of, sort of growing out of it but i feel like that's always something that sometimes just pops up in your head when you're playing which also yeah. like disables you from being able to fully express yourself and play what you want to, which then frustrates you. And they're like, oh my gosh, what are I doing? But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Falling not, down the hole. Up. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that at every show. And then you just got to tell yourself, I'm here to have fun. And I guess to, to back up what she was saying, um, think of all, think of like your favorite music. All that music is personal. Like the most powerful music is personal. It's not like it's not someone being like, I'm here to show off. I need to do. I need to play this. I need to sound good. Blah blah blah. Because that music isn't fun to listen to. And I don't want to throw shade on any genres because I know people that love those genres and they're like, no, that's not right. <laughs> but yeah, think of it like, why do you think people respond so well to those you know those corny pop songs with just the vocals and the piano? It's because it's personal. They're t- they're like playing. They're singing and playing with emotion. So yeah. 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 The connection. Exactly. Um, how do you guys feel about like incorporating like your personality when you're playing and like um like I don't know, like you as a person showing through your improv? Oh, that's it's so opposite because I'm such a quiet and timid person and then my playing is so opposite when it comes to like if I'm getting mad at actually it's that's it's weird because if I get excited, you can hear it in my playing. I mean, to that point, but like as a person, normally I'm just quiet and laid back. And meanwhile, my solos are just like I'm trying to rip out some stuff and be tasteful with it. I don't know. That's just my personal feeling about it. <laughs> I don't know what other people. I don't know what other people see. That's the thing because it's from my perspective. But yeah, I mean, I listen to my solos back. I'm like, I sound like that. I thought I'd sound more like timid or something on my instrument but i guess it still reflects like you genuinely because you are feeling excited in that moment and probably yeah. feeling confident in that moment you know yeah 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 that makes sense i mean when i'm on stage i'm like the happiest and most excited i am so i guess yeah disregard everything i just said <laughs> <laughs> um wait i think we should stay on that question that's a good question though all right yeah everyone else wants to talk go ahead I feel like for a lot of people that I'm like closer to and I've seen them solo, it's kind of like more so their inner personality, like the stuff that they don't necessarily yeah, show. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you can like you can see some similarities between how they act, but then you see them and they look like sort of comfortable and natural and you're like, I can tell that that's who you really are. And that's like Ooh, what you really That's do. such facts, dude. That's yeah. I've seen some chill people with some aggressive solos. <laughs> I'm like, so that's how you're feeling on the inside. <laughs> I always find it hard because I, I don't actually know how to critique my own solo. Like, I, I record it, I, I listen to it, I just can't do it. Like, it, it it's impossible for me. I don't know. Um, so it's a bit hard for me to say, oh, I'm I'm like I can I can compare some of my solos. Like, oh, this was a better, like slightly better solo in this way. Um, but I actually don't quite know what, what the personality of my solos really is. Um, except for the fact that what, like when I solo later at night, uh, they get more and more out of the chord progression, more and more wild. And that's, uh, all, yeah. <laughs> that's all I know. Yeah. Because, um, I don't know, I just feel like also like my mood and like what I'm feeling like mm. that day and while I'm on stage, like totally dictates like probably the way I play. Um, and like... I don't know. I just feel like you can, like, you can, um, I feel like soloing is like talking. Like, that's the point. Like, it's supposed to be a conversation, stuff like that. So, like, when you're talking, like, you, like, 
I don't know, like sometimes you get excited or sometimes you like tell a joke or something. Like I, I think about that sometimes. Like you ever see people like tell a joke like in their solo, like yeah. through the notes they're playing? Like I just think that's so cool. Like yeah. if you like if you like quote like a standard or like you or, or quote something, something. Yeah, yeah, quote yeah, quote something or like or like do some sort of comedic thing through the music. Like I think that's so sick because it's just like you're talking and if you're like if you want to make a joke, then you make a joke through the notes you're playing. Like, yeah. One thing I do sometimes when I'm soloing is I'll start laughing. Because, okay, I, <laughs> Same, bro. I'm just having so much fun sometimes that I'm like playing and then like maybe I'll like choke or something and I'll laugh, or I'll giggle. Or if I'm playing something and I remember a rhythm someone plays. I'll play it and then I'll look at them and they will like will instantly be like, hey, you know, I think like um, having conversations with people during your soloing too. I feel like I look around a lot when I'm playing, like at other people. <laughs> or yeah. sometimes I look down, but. Um, yeah, I'm the same. Literally, I always look at the drummer. I always, am, I'm always having my back to the audience looking at the drummer. And my everyone like looking at me, they're like, why are you? Why is your back to the audience? I'm like, because I'm trying to jam. The audience will feel that. And that's the that's the feeling we all love. Yeah. Us feeling it and then them feeling that too. Yeah. That's what it, it makes them feel like they're in on the conversation, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You guys all said some really amazing things throughout this whole thing. Maybe uh, just everyone give like last piece of advice to all the listeners or to everyone in the group or whoever about theory and improvisation whoever wants to start can <laughs> nope this they don't get advice today action. okay so yeah my final advice would be like remember why you're improving and go about it from you have like the layers like an on like an onion like an ogre um <laughs> anyone check reference yes. um, okay so the center of the ogre is moving people that is the center of the ogre <laughs> you go you, you go out one layer you want to connect with people so you want to connect people on a deep level like you know that and then you want to like have a conversation like a natural conversation that's the next like priority next layer of the ogre is um just doing like playing what sounds good in the moment and letting it come naturally and not like, you know, um, holding yourself down and like, just like, you know, let it kind of flow. And then I'd say the outer part is like the theory, you know, and then that's um, like the icing on the, wait, <laughs> too many metaphors. The icing on the ogre. <laughs> Ew! The icing on the ogre will have to be the theory because... <laughs> That's, you know, that's not the priority. The priority is not to show your theory knowledge. That's what helps you. That is the icing on the ogre. Um, Can we make shirts that say that? (laughs) That is the icing on the ogre. Can you put my face on them? Yes. (laughs) Oh, sick. Which track yours? So that's my advice. Thank you. Good night. (laughs) All right. I'll get deep. I'll get deep right quick. Um. When you're improving, when you're improving, just think of it like, why? What's the reason why you're playing music? You know, you're there to have fun and just enjoy the music, listen to the music, and that's that's what you should be doing. The- theory is great, like it's great. It helps. It helps you understand a lot that you're doing on your instrument. It helps you organize everything. It helps you, you know, understand what you're doing. But at the end of the day, I'd much rather play with someone who's got an amazing feel and loves what they're doing than it's just, I'm a theoretician. I, I, stu- I study music theory, you know? Because I play with a bunch of people like that, and they're not fun to play with. No shade, but like, they're not fun to play with. I'd rather play with someone who's just got a feel and is there to have a great time. I finish my advice. Buenas noches. Um, yeah, I feel like... Uh, going back to what I, I said earlier, it's kind of using theory as a tool to make people feel and to connect to people. And I think that's the real goal is to play what you love and to 
by playing what you love to connect to people and all the theory stuff and all the you know whatever notes and modes and motifs and chords you're playing they're all tools and they're, they're all kind of a path towards getting that goal um and so if you play them and if you incorporate them and you're playing great and if you don't and it still sounds good and it still connects to people that's also great you know um so really just follow whatever your mind and your your heart and and your musical ear tell you to do and oh and no wrong notes once once <laughs> once you realize once you know how to play right notes you realize that there's no wrong notes yeah that's one thing i'd say the theory does that scares you away from playing notes outside of the key or the scale it scares you away from that but those are the most interesting solos are the ones that do outside the key and stuff like that thank you guys so much for joining us thank you yeah. for having us yeah, yeah. i really appreciate it thank you yeah. so much this is the best moment of my life <laughs> <laughs> i feel changed on the spirit <laughs> <laughs> I'm a new person. Yeah, it is. I haven't seen you guys in so long. Yeah, seriously. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. We had so much fun talking to all of them. If you enjoyed this episode, please go back and listen to our four before this one, and continue to listen in the future. Follow us on Instagram at ETMS Podcast, and uh, send us questions, concerns, comments, <laughs> stuff like that. I don't know, something that we can respond to, I guess. And yes. Yeah. Have a great day. Have a great day. That's. And play from your soul and your heart. Okay. Enough. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>